Hey friends, it's MJ from the Coaches Panel and welcome back to another episode of the 50 Most Relevant where I count you down over a 50-day period, let you know across AFL Fantasy, Super Coach and Dream Team, who I think are the most relevant players to talk about for the coming 2024 fantasy footy season. Joining me on this episode as we talk about Cam Guthrie, his fellow co-founder. You've heard him on not just the 50 Most Relevant, but a number of strategy episodes and really become a key part of the coaches panel since its inception he joins me for his first time this preseason. Ritz, mate good to see you and welcome to your first episode of the 50 for 2024 and we start again mj it's we're all going again. again we're doing it again can guthrie's a fascinating player I'm, I'm super pumped to be able to talk with you about him let's look in depth at some of his not just his 2023 season but the season's prior that has built him into this relevance. He's priced at just over 420000 for us in Supercoach, 762000 in AFL Fantasy, while just a touch over 720000 in Dream Team. In Supercoach, an average of 83.6 last year. He's not priced at that, and we'll talk about why in just a moment. He did deliver just one tonne for us last season, 116. That's around about 50 points skinny of a career high score. That is a 163 for him. Over in AFL Fantasy and Dream Team, an average of 86.8. Again, he's not priced at that. We will unpack that reason in a moment. The one tonne in that format last year was an, a score of 111. And a top career high score for him is 153. Ritz, it was a probably a bit of a frustrating year, not just for Cam, but for all of the Geelong Football Club, that breakthrough premiership with the retirement home to end 2022. And then for a bunch of different reasons, the season just felt like it had kind of stalled from week one for the Cats, didn't it? They never really got going for a number of different reasons. No, you're right. And... But, I, I mean, that's probably why we're talking about Cam Guthrie, is it not? Because of those hiccups, those little hurdles along the way, the bad year last year, he actually represents values across the formats this year. It's some significant value for it. One of the big reasons for why he's in giving us so much value is because in round six, he ended up getting subbed out of this grand final rematch against the Sydney Swans. They decimated in that game too, but gets subbed out with a little bit of a toe complaint that had frustrated him in bits and periods throughout the game. The club gave him a couple of weeks off, hope he'd be fine, made the decision, nah, this is worse than we thought. We're going to have to send him in for surgery. That happened in June. The hope was that he'd be able to play late in the season. He even came back and played some VFL in August, but the club chose to put him on ice, make sure he's cherry ripe for us heading into 2024. When we look at this season of 2023, um, the one ton across all of the formats, just two scores across the formats on top of that, that went 90 plus and he averaged an 83.6 in Supercoach and that 86.8 in AFL Fantasy and Dream Team. Where's the value you might hear us talking about? Well, let's just look at the previous two seasons that Rids has alluded to where this value might have come. In 2022, played every single game, averaged 95.8 in Dream Team and Fantasy, and went at 99.2 in Supercoach. In that year, both formats, he scored 10 tons across each format, and three times he went 120 plus. But it's really 2021 that he really hit his fantasy footy peak grids, an average of 109.9 in AFL Fantasy and Dream Team, 16 tons, four scores of 120 plus, and just the one under 80. While in Supercoach, an average of 113, 15 tons, eight of them over 120, an additional two scores of 90 plus and just the two scores sub 80 for a guy rids that's priced at 84 in AFL fantasy 75 in super coach and priced at 78 in dream team. We could have, depending on the format you play 25 right up to 40 points per game of value with this selection. And the thing with him though, is we're talking about two different teams this year to two years ago. We're talking about a premiership like contender, in 21, we're talking about 2022, they won the premiership, you know? Like, we're talking about people, Joel Selwood, Patrick Dangerfield. Isaac we're Smith talking about Selwood. Isaac Smith. We're talking people have sort of moved on 
and gone down another way. Now, they've had to rejuvenate their midfield. So I was looking at their midfield the other day, and that's as bad a midfield as I can remember from a Geelong side, like point of view. So there's absolutely opportunity there. All we need is our pre-season where we can get a bit of confidence about it. I think that's the beauty of it. When we're considering a player like Cam Guthrie and whether or not he's right for your starting squad, or is it in a moment I want to do talk about if we were to look at trading into him during the season, what are the things that we need to look at? There's probably four or five key considerations. Of course, his role in this Geelong midfield, and I want to unpack this midfield with you in a moment. What does this fixture look like? What is this way we structural our way through the early multi-buy rounds and the best 18s inside the first six weeks. And then the overall importance of mid-price players for Supercoach, AFL Fantasy and Dream Team. Uh, let's unpack this midfield a little bit, Rids. It's interesting. They had 30 players, including Rucks, roll through centre bounces last year. It was the leader in the AFL. They just gave so many people opportunities. And what are they going to do with this midfield? Do they give some of the older crew still the opportunity to lead it? Do they fully blood the kids? Do they do a mentoring halfway house between it? Because I look at it, there's Guthrie, Dangerfield, Atkins and Jack Bowes that are the 25 plus brigade. Now they might not all be in core center bounce midfield, but they're all through there. And then you've got, I suppose, Sean Manny, you could throw in there as a mature age recruit as well. But then it's the under 22 brigade of Tanner Bruin, Mitch Nevitt, Max Holmes, Jai Clark, George Stevens, who they picked up also in the draft. What's your take on how you think this midfield spills out for us? And ultimately then Cam Guthrie's role in fantasy this year. Yeah, so I think um, Chris Scott's a very um, proud guy. So I don't think we're going to see... Like, they've already pushed a Mitch Duncan back to the halfback line. They've. I don't think... I think it's going to be too risky if they move a Cam Guthrie back into that sort of position as well, alongside of a Mitch Duncan. So what I think is going to happen is he's going to free up a little bit. You know, Dangerfield will go more forward. I think Duncan goes more back again, like he did last year, especially with no Isaac Smith to roll backwards and forwards as he was doing along that wing. And I think what you'll find is Guthrie is just going to be the midfield, like they're just going to build around him. They've got plenty of opportunity to get a lot of games into some of these kids, like Jai Clark, we're talking, you know, Tanner Bruin, we're talking, you know, the guys you mentioned before, Nevitt, Holmes. They're just going to have to find that mix and get those games into those legs as a group. But there's no reason why Guthrie doesn't actually become the cornerstone for it, you know, for this year at least. I think you'll build that case. Last year, he attended 58% of centre bounces before he lost his season to injury in 2022. It was 65%. The year prior in 2021, it was 68%. And you might be going, oh, that's a gradual fade. The dude got injured during the game. And so it's certainly not a, a complete, yes, he's on a CBA regression, but I'm with you, Reeds. I, I feel like it's not just important that they mentor these young cats through there. I think Cam for at least 12 more months is the leader of the pack. If fully fit and over his toe injury, which all reports coming out of the club is, yeah, he's good to go. He's, he's having an uninterrupted preseason, which is really the other other thing. But it's not just the midfield for me that gives me confidence around that is this pride, not pride in a bad way, but pride as in we are a good football team. They've still got a forward line of Hawkins, Cameron, Stengel, Henry, any defense that's got a De Conning and a Stewart. Like they don't want to waste these last few years, especially of a, of a Hawkins, Stewart and Cameron, who are only got a couple more years of footy left in them they're probably not going to waste them with, right, we're going to give us three years of rebuilding with the kids in the midfield. While I don't see them as a premiership threat, I'm not, I'm not sure you do either. I, I'm with you. I think Guthrie has to play through the mids, not just should play through the mids. Yeah, I agree. And so, but again, it's up early days, Radio. Yeah. So it, he's got to be on your watch list for the very, like, for at least... The least you can have is Cam Guthrie sitting there going, I'm going to pay attention if someone mentions the name Cam Guthrie over preseason. 
you know, whether it's a time trial, and we've seen it, yeah, MJ already. A lot of names are coming out of time trials. It's like the greatest thing on earth, apparently, <laughs> like in the preseason. Like, you, you want to win it or come second, and suddenly you're the most relevant person in your football club. Like, I mean... What you really want to do is see whether his name gets mentioned in some interviews, but his name doesn't get mentioned in regards to missing sessions. That's one of the keys. Like these older types, you're going to have to move your way through it. But that midfield mix, and you think about it, we could have a Mark Blickhalves playing through there, a Tom Atkins playing through, a little bit of danger there, a little bit of Duncan, Camp. They've still got a very, very solid midfield mix if they want to try and they believe that they could contend, you know, for the finals. So, I mean, even a Mark O'Connor, we've seen him tagging. We've seen yep. him thrown in the back lines. We've seen him just go everywhere. Like a Zach Tui spent a lot of time in the midfield last year. Yeah, you know? Everybody did. Yeah, well, Jack Bowes, <laughs> how's did. he going to go, you know, with a another preseason yeah there's a lot of unknowns about this this is that's what the beauty of the saying, preseason, cam cam guthrie needs to just be on your watch list for now and i'll explain it a bit more later on okay but right now and we've got to split the formats i i say this i think every, we do at this point but we really do okay afl fantasy he's priced at a little bit higher than what he is across the other formats. Yep. So, and that's because of the pricing formula, okay, that they they like to use. Whether it's right or wrong, it doesn't it's matter. It's what they use. It's just what it is. The thing is, he's priced at 84. So he's not going to represent that 10, 15, you know, ballpark, you know, the ball out of the stadium type home run, mm. nail it. He's, he's not going to be that. But I'm going to throw a little bit of a curveball in a couple of, you know, a little bit longer. Because mm. um, there are options around this with this round zero that we've now encountered. Uh, this round one, two, three, the early buys that have come into mm. it. There's ways around this. But let's explore that soon. But so AF, it's almost as if you go, you know what? I'm just going to park him there and I'm mm. going to look at him after a couple of games of football. That's sure. the only way to do it, okay, for now. For yeah. Super Coach and Dream Team, however, he is actually priced okay. He, yeah. he he represents quite a bit of value. Like, there's a lot of guys this year in that midfield that represent a lot of value, okay? There's guys, and I'm just going to throw some names out there right now, Please. and I'm not gonna, And some of them may feature in the top 50. Some of them are absolutely spec names right now. But we're talking guys like Ollie Wines. We're talking Jai Simpkins. We're talking Paddy Dow, if you want to go down that far. Let's just say a Jacob Hopper, even, across the formats. All comparable prices. Like, that's what we're in the ballpark. We're actually looking at that M5, M6, M7 sort of area to start with, depending on whatever the structure you want to have those best 18 rounds through those early buys. So it's all going to be team specific on whatever your team structure is going to be. will then flow into what's the best available for each of those positions as you go through. Because best 18, as you know, MJ, we're going to be talking mm. about this till the cows come home. A lot yeah? over the next two months, yes. Like it is going to be so much strategy. Okay, around it. And we know AF, with the strategy, what happens is, you know, we've got little brackets of the community. We we hear something good, and then suddenly that gets caught in groupthink, and everyone incorporates it as their own strategy. Sure. So and that's just the way it works with the social media and everything else, okay? You've just got to understand that that's what's going to happen. So... You don't want to own someone at that low, low ownership early on, taking all the risk, because you don't want to have a unique that sucks ass, yeah? Oh, that season you want to almost have someone, over right there. Exactly. In AF, that's how it works. Mm. You want to have someone with a high ownership that sucks ass, because it affects everyone then. Minimize risk and then take the pathways. Yeah. 
okay. So, but you could trade into him in AF. There's no worries about that, especially if groupthink comes over. Mm -hmm. If they start realizing MJ when they look at round four, five, and six, oh, wow. If you look at DFS Australia for inside mids and he's got that role over the first three rounds, mm -hmm. guess what? They play three of the best matchups, including North Melbourne. And again, this is a lot of hearsay, Rodio, the sure. Bulldogs. Like, this is, we're taking a bit of. We're taking like a little bit of fun with this because we're using creative license. That we've got a whole preseason where things are going to change. Doesn't matter, Rodio. That's all we got right now. But you've got, I guarantee you, mate, there'll be group thing coming all day in AF. He's going to be one of the most traded in players come round four especially if you start, I don't know, let's let's go your little baby, eh? Josh Kelly. Let's throw, it's the only way we might get him into the 50 most relevant. Let, let's talk about that. Josh Kelly got that latter of the buy rounds. Yep. No buy round problems for Mitch Duncan in the opening six weeks where four of the first six weeks, so round one to six, are best 18 on field. So you're talking about round four is that, prediction point with the Bulldogs at Adelaide Oval. So it's gather round North Melbourne yep. at home at GMHBA stadium. And then they head up North to the Brisbane lions against. Well, okay. So, but let's just focus on your little fella. Okay? Josh Kelly. He's in the podcast, ladies and gentlemen. They play Collingwood round zero opening round. Okay. If he pops 110 plus he backs up with North Melbourne and West coast round one and round two, two of the best so opponents from 2023. Then he has a buy in round three, mate. When Guthrie starts, um, he goes to Hawthorne, he goes to Bulldogs, he goes to North Melbourne, and then he goes off to Brisbane, then he ducks across to Carlton after that. But yep. we're talking, okay, if you want to do a little bit of a best 18, I want to make sure my best 18, let's go flip around a bit. Mm -hmm. Why not, mate? That it's is absolutely a, a viable play, yeah, in AF. And, and a really important thing too with rolling lockouts this year, that's the Easter Monday matchup on the Hawks. So those best 18 players that works like a traditional buy round where they'll be blue dotted, you'll be able to move them until the end of the round. So you've got that opportunity to look at what your squad is doing. And if you're like, no, this is the move and the play for me. It gives you the opportunity deep in the week to be able to make that move. And that could be either a league focus or overall ranking. Certain players might have really struggled. Others might have really well performed. You see pathways and avenues. So this is what Riz is really talking about is don't just enter in with a, it's round one or bust with Guthrie. You absolutely can start him there. There's no problem with that. It's not an easy fixture with the Saints and the Crows early up. But in AF especially, you've got that easy option to move in. It's still a play in the other formats, but it's an easy option to roll through there if you need it. Let's talk about best 18 for a moment, Rids, before we do look to wrap up this episode. There's been some narrative amongst the community that because four of the opening six weeks of the year are best 18, it lends itself to, in some of the formats, maybe even all, to regress back to more of a guns and rookies approach or a, a premiums and cash cows and this mid-range sort of player that historically probably more AFL fantasy than the other formats. We've looked at this 15 to 30 points per game type of value player and jumped on. There is some thought process in the community that maybe we might not need players in the Guthrie range across the formats this year. It's only early January. And there's plenty of new information to come out. But what's your initial take on whether or not guns and rooks are the right approach? And guys in this mid-range, we might be fading in 2024. I haven't thought heaps about it right now. But the thing is, okay, whichever way you go, you're still going to need to build that team value. You're still going to need to go and complete your team as quick as you possibly can. You still want to generate that cash as you start getting it through. Rodeo. Now, it, the difference will be this year is there might be quite a few points difference between the first, you know, the top echelon of the top 100 in the first few weeks, you know, come the buys and best 18. 
you might actually, you know, have a little bit more difference between first and a thousandth or whatever it is. Mm. Last year, I think there was, I think there was like nearly 10,000 teams within quite a few, what, 200 points in yeah, the first very small five now. rounds. You know, and that was across the formats. So we might actually see that double though with mm. who, however you do it. But the thing is, we're going to see teams really fly home a lot quicker than what we saw in, in previous years. Because what you'll find is the top echelon, well, the top percentage of the teams that are highest rank early on through those best 18 rounds will probably have more of a guns and rooks approach. True. I want to have the best amount of 18 available I want to, you know, get the most points out of those guys. Like, that's how they're going to structure up, but that's going to hurt you in the long run if other teams are taking those 10, 15-point hits, you know, cross players to try and generate more cash and jump on those guys. Because if those ones that do guns and rooks, mate, and you think about it, years ago, um, we never really had it in AF. Um, we started to, and then it sort of transformed to two, you know, two trades, lose them or use them, mm. you know, use them or lose them or however you want to say it, it's Christmas, yeah? <laughs> so, um, and then Selby came in and actually started the focus being on that team build, team Timo, dollar. Yeah team value and everything else. So what we're seeing though now is people will have to go sideways trading through those best 18s if they're going to go at guns and rooks. If none of those rookies really pop for those rounds, they're going to have to go and force a trade, you know, early on, which may actually hurt you in the long run as well because you may end up trading out, oh, I don't know, let's say a Josh Dunkley, um, sure. I'm just or yeah, Carlton. you're picking a name for a namesake, sure. But yeah, you might have to trade one of those to someone who's playing for that round. You don't you don't want to trade out of Tom Green, for instance, sure. come round three, because you would have selected Tom Green because you're thinking, well, he's a captain option, he's viable. I want to keep him for as long as I can for the season, but you don't want to go Tom Green to a uh, Sam Walsh. No. Who who is riskier, not risky, but riskier mm. from your mindset because of what Tom Green produced last year. So it's going to be challenging, mate. It's going to be really crazy, some of the mm. strategies that are out there. Everyone's going to probably hear a different thought process through 2024 with the yep. strategy episodes and there's a lot out there yeah whether it's af whether it's super coach i mean although dt doesn't matter without being well dt doesn't really matter because no one is playing it and you know that's all good so let's just go with super coach for now we're going to hear a very very divisive guns and rooks versus value okay debate this year because They've only just incorporated and come on the train of value as the focus, the team builds and everything else over the last year or two with Selby playing super coach and doing so well two years ago. Mm. So that's going to be conflicting for them as well. Well, these guys who have grown up and we've been part of it, MJ, yeah? We came from old school. Guns and Rooks is the only way to do it. You know, captaincy <laughs> and points and... Like, you know, it's going to be very divisive at times through that super coach. AF is going to be even more intriguing mm. because groupthink could go, we might have two or three groupthinks happening at one time. It really could. Like, and you know what it's like, yeah? It either comes from the traders or whether it's Selby or whoever it is, whatever podcast you listen to, whoever you follow, it's yeah, going to kind of be... sway your opinion, and that's totally fine. And it could be Minimark, for instance, who's been absolutely a superstar for sure. the last couple of years in across all the formats. You know, someone like yep. a mini monk might go, you know what? It's guns and rookies for super code and it's value for AF. And it's that that's actually viable, mate. That could actually work. 
it absolutely sets the pathways for us. I think ultimately with Guthrie, as we come back to him and wrap up the episode, there's a couple of avenues. You've got probably three core outcomes, I suppose. Um, and that's on the premise that he has that midfield role that we alluded to. If he's not got that role, then yeah, through process of elimination, at least in your starting squad, you're not going to put him there. But if he does, let's say he does, eight rolls out that hundred over the first six, eight, 10, 12 weeks of the year. Well, you're probably going to reevaluate it at that end of year or mid season buy for the cats. That feels like a victory. The other option you've got, if he isn't someone you start with, Riz has already addressed it, man, is it at round three? Is it at round four? You, you choose to trade into him. Should he be scoring well? And then you've almost got the inverse of that is if he doesn't quite live up to this forecasted scoring hope that you've got, well, without having to change your structure too much, he gives you an easy parachute and now he's a trade asset and he lets you get into the Will Setterfield type of 2023 where you go, that's the guy that's at a significant price reduction, delivering premium scoring, and I'm going to bank both points and cash generation win-win. So to me, regardless of what happens with Guthrie, he becomes super, super relevant for us in 2024. And the good news, as Rid said right at the start of this episode, it's all about putting him on the watch list and observing what happens over these coming eight weeks before we get to the start of the 2024 season. So MJ, I mm. just wanted to highlight something, okay? Please. Now, I said before that AEF, it's going to be a little bit just for the pricing, okay? I just wanted to mention this, okay? If you look at Cam Guthrie in Dream Team, yeah. okay? He's 721000 If you have a look at the next guy on the list, it's Ollie Wines at 716000 So there's only a 5000 gap between the yeah, two. It's negligible. Okay. Now, in AFL Fantasy, however, you've got Guthrie who's 762. Correct. Ollie Wines is actually seven hundred. That's the difference in the gaps between the two. And I think if you keep looking through it, that's why you've got to separate them. Okay? You've actually got to work out who represents the value. If you're going to go a value option, you've got to go who represents the value on that format. In Dream Team, I would be suggesting to you, go out and have a serious look at Guthrie if you're looking at mm. a Guthrie type at M5. Mm. In AF, you might be leaning towards Wines if that 60,000 gets you another player to who you want it. So that's why you've just got to separate it a little bit better. That's all. Yeah, some really good advice. So let's talk about his draft and where he lands. If you kind of roll up his last three years, including this injury-affected season of 2023, he's rolled up 2021 to 23 averages in AFL Fantasy and Dream Team is a 97.5. And in Supercoach, it's a 98.7. So that'd be a great outcome for owners on draft day that they basically are getting a guy that's, a handball away from a hundred midfielder based on that rolled up average. He's going to go outside of the top 30 midfielders using the 2023 data, which I, I think is about right. I don't see anyone picking him inside the top 30 midfielders. You could probably target him rids with an M five selection with the potential. If you're lucky, he might drift to an M six and he's got the upside of an M two. Where do you think you can see yourself picking Cam Guthrie? I know each format's different. He's better in Supercoach than AF and DT, but where do you see yourself thinking he'll go on draft day? So if you're playing 15 in your teams, I would be looking at probably around the 14th, 15th selection um, right. and have him coming through as one of those midfielders. So save your M's last midfield spot for him. I think he's going to slide a little bit more than what you think like on well, those numbers only due to his injury history of the last two years, his age getting older, the uncertainty of what's going to happen with the role, like at this point in time, I think he might slide to that sort of position. If you can get him at awesome. that, absolutely jump on. Yeah. that. Oh, if I'm getting Guthrie at my last or second last on field midfield spot, man, I, I'm, Barring some injury, like I'm feeling like I'm in a really, really good spot on draft. So MJ, day. just on Guthrie of the draft, what do you mm. if you've got 
one midfield spot left and you've got Guthrie and you've got Paddy Dow still available in the pool, who do you lean to? And this is the sort of suggestion. I would probably look at Dow. Just a new adventure. So that's the sort of dilemmas you will be finding yourself in. Someone like a Jeremy Sharp, for instance, Mm -hmm. in a draft. If he's he could actually be a viable 70 type player at, you know, change a home, big oval, suit his style, the team screaming for a winger. He could be a 70, 75, 80 guy. There's no worries about that. Like in a draft, that's not bad. Depending on the depth of squads and coaches and all those variables that come in. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely, it is. Hey, Rids, you've been a superstar, not just on this episode, but right throughout the entirety of the history of the Coaches Panel. It's great to have you back on board for another preseason. Easy, man. If you want to go and read the article on Cam or any of the other players we've revealed so far, you can go and check it out at coachespanel.tv. In under 60 seconds, I'm going to give you a quick clue to let you know who's coming in tomorrow at the 50 most relevant. But if you haven't gone and checked out the audio podcast yet, you can go and check them out wherever you go and subscribe to podcasts. You can get it there. Make sure you follow it. Leave a nice five-star rating and review. It does help others discover the Coaches Panel that are looking for fantasy football content in the off season or in the pre seasons, you can also go and check out these videos on YouTube. Every single one of them are dropped for you there. Make sure you subscribe, turn the notifications on. You get notified straight away as soon as these episodes go up live and you can join the conversation this preseason, whether it be about Cam Guthrie or any of the other players we've revealed and that will come so far in the 50 most relevant. If you want to know where you can find us across social media, All the links are in the description of this episode. You can go and check it out, as well as our Patreon. They are getting, if they're at our breakout or premium tier, they are getting these audio podcasts 24 hours early. So they already know who we're talking about as I'm about to give you this clue. So if you want to get early access, get a bunch of other hidden content, exclusive groups, and a bunch of other tier rewards, let alone to show your support of the coaches panel, all the details can also be found in the description of this video. All right, so who is coming in tomorrow in the 50 most relevant? Here's a couple of clues. We're going to head to the forward line, a line that is filled with many with pain. But I choose to not see it as pain. I choose to see it as upside because there's what I've seen from this player. If the one variable I've heard that is true about what this person is doing for their club this offseason, this person isn't just supreme value not just a guy that could break out but but could be in his position one of the most valuable assets we have in our starting squad and he could do something incredible for us he's proven but he's value how can those two things coexist in a line that we don't like i'll tell you tomorrow in the 50 most relevant